We're going to sing a few songs together tonight to the Lord. We're going to begin by singing hymn number 339, Standing on the Promises. Sure you do, Ronald. You get to stand, okay? All right, let's sing together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God hymn number new 229 are you washed in the blood and we'll sing all the verses of that good old hymn as well 229 let's sing it together have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in. <coughs> <coughs> Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. 
and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And then we will just do the first and the fourth verse of Be Thou My Vision. And be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best Lord, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life on the fourth high king of heaven my victory won may i reach heaven's joys O bright heaven's sun heart of my own heart whatever befall Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Tyler, if you'd come forward and we'll have our offering at this time. I'm grateful for a good day in the Lord's house today and a beautiful day. We need to pray for many of those. I would just call your attention again to the Bob Kramer family um, with the um, memorial service on Tuesday at 2. Dana continues to fight breast cancer and go through chemo treatments, and Desi continues to go through chemo for melanoma. Desiree Gibson found out this last week that Stan Crowder has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he's asked to be put on the prayer list and would like us to pray for him and looking at perhaps, uh, what, what, what they call that, the proton um, therapy um, radiation, and uh, that'll be pretty intense, maybe, maybe every day for six to nine weeks in Oklahoma City. Um, treatment awaiting him, and there's others that we have in need as well. So let's remember those folks tonight. Father, thank you for your love and for your care. Thank you for this offering. We pray you'd use it for your glory. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sue. If you have your Bible, open it to the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, the third book of the Bible, third book in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and we'll be in Leviticus chapter 9 tonight, and I call this Leviticus an overview, an examination of some key passages in Leviticus. We have tried to paint this canvas with a broad brush um, through an introduction, an outline, a hermeneutic, remember her hermeneutic means uh, the art of interpretation. So how do we approach the book of Leviticus and books of the law? It's important to remember that different parts of the Bible are different types of literature and you read different parts of literature differently. So just like you and I know, if we were to pull up a book and it was a nonfiction work, 
we would read that a little bit differently than if we were reading a fiction work that we assumed to be uh, not historically true from the beginning, right? And so the same thing is true in the Bible. There are there is law, there are prophets, there are uh, letters, epistles, there are gospels, there are parables within the gospels. There's apocalyptic literature where there's multiple creatures with multiple heads and arms, and, and they represent different things, right? And so um, as we approach the scripture, it's important to know how to interpret that. And we looked at that last week, and I'll review that tonight. And tonight what we're going to do after we review that is we're just going to look at an overview of some of those key passages in Leviticus. Um, remember... Um, Some housekeeping matters, Leviticus, by way of Latin from the Greek, means pertaining to the Levites, which is one of the two big reasons this book doesn't get read as much as it probably should. Number one, it's written for priests, and sometimes we hear who a letter is written to or a book is written to, and if it's not to us, we check out. So it's written for priests, and we're not priests, so we say, okay, that's not for me. The second reason is, is that the book doesn't contain a lot of narrative, all right? There's only four books of the 39 in the Old Testament that contain what we would call law, That begins in Exodus chapter 20, and it runs through Deuteronomy chapter 33. We consider those four books, the Old Testament law, the things found in there. and call that the Old Testament law. Um, Remember some interpretation guidelines just very quickly. Do see the Old Testament law as God's fully inspired word for you. Don't see the Old Testament law as God's direct command to you. Do see the Old Testament law as the basis for the Old Covenant and therefore for Israel's history. Don't see the Old Testament law as binding on Christians in the New Covenant, except where specifically renewed. Do see God's justice, love, and high standards in the Old Testament law. Don't fail to see that God's mercy is made equal to the severity of the standards. That's the beauty of Leviticus, is that, oh, God is holy, and oh, he's serious about sin, but he's also so loving that he would allow a substitute. Okay, you can learn that, both of those things in Leviticus. Do see the Old Testament law as a paradigm providing examples for the full range of behavior that was expected. Don't see the Old Testament law as complete. It is not comprehensive. Do remember that the essence of the law is repeated in the prophets and renewed in the New Testament. Remember, testament means covenant, and we are part of the New Covenant. The New Covenant does renew some of the Old Covenant, and I'll remind you of that. The part of the Old Covenant we're required to follow is that which was renewed in the new covenant. And that's very simply in two things that we see. First of all is in those two chief laws. You remember when Jesus said all the law hangs on this? What did he say? Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. All the law hangs on that. Okay? We get love the Lord your God from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, seated deeply in, in the law, in the interior part of the law. We get love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus chapter 19 and 18. Jesus spoke to those things and renewed those things as a part of the new covenant. <coughs> and then, of course, the Ten Commandments are spoken to again in Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 37, also in John. Don't expect the Old Testament law to be cited frequently by the prophets or the New Testament. It's just not there that much. Do see the Old Testament law as a generous gift to Israel, bringing much blessing when obeyed. Don't see the Old Testament law as a grouping of arbitrary, annoying regulations limiting people's freedom. Okay, those are just some do's and don'ts for a Christian who opens up Leviticus to read it. Those are some things that will help you. Okay, so what happened during Leviticus? Let's look at this overview tonight. And first of all, I want you to see the priests begin their ministry, okay? Point number one, and I've just got some narrative points here for you. The priests begin their ministry. Leviticus chapter 9, I'm going to read for you the first seven verses. <coughs> and it says this. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people. And bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord had 
commanded. You need to remember Aaron was the head of the tribe of Levi. He was the head of the Levites. And he and his sons were the beginning of the priesthood. And here in these first seven verses, it's just specific instruction for them to begin their ministry. And you can also find in verses 23 and 24 there, Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So you see in Leviticus, the priests begin their ministry and do the things that God had told them to do. And there was a certain way that they were prescribed to do these things so it would be in accordance with the way that the Lord had set it up. Okay, And then all the way through Leviticus, and we'll read it again in chapter 10 here, God reminds the people that he is holy. God reminds the people that he is holy. Look with me to chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That's a, that's a real, um, that's a very alive, strong word when you read, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. It's kind of one of those mic drop moments, right? He says, I'm serious about this. And he says, thank you. And he says, the people that are near me, he's talking about the people who've been given the job to be his priest, right? So definitely, if you're among the people who are supposed to be of the inner circle, who are supposed to be carrying out these things and being mediators for these people, you for sure better do what I say. I'm going to be sanctified. I'm going to be set apart among these people and among everybody. I'm going to be glorified. So he reminds them that he is holy. Then thirdly, the Israelites were taught about the Day of Atonement. And to me, this is maybe the key passage in, in Leviticus. This is the key passage that points to the New Testament. As you read the Old Testament, the best way to read the Old Testament is to read it in light of the coming King Jesus. And so as you read the Old Testament, you will find in every book of the Bible, God uses the history and the story and the narrative and the and the prophecies, just you just fill in the blanks to what book you're reading. It points you forward to the coming Messiah. And when we read here about the Day of Atonement, it points us forward to the sacrifice of Jesus for us. And so let's read a good chunk of scripture there together in Leviticus chapter 16. Okay, and I'm going to read quite a bit, but I want you to hear the story, and then I'll kind of break it down for you. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering he shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on and he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bulls a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull, as a sin offering for himself, shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself, and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. Two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, he shall 
bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And then I'm going to spare you reading verses 15 through 19 as he just continues to say that what they're going to do is what they had said they were going to do. Verse 20, when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall present the live goat. This is the part of that day of atonement. This is where I really want you to hone in. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put on them on the head of the goat and send it, excuse me, he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body in water in the holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people. Make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar, and he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering and goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire, and he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. Now look at verse 29. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you. You shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated, this priest in his father's place, shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priest and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Now I know that's a mouthful. And I realize there's plenty going on there, but let me just kind of break it down for you. On the 10th day, of the seven month, seventh month, they would recognize this day of atonement. There would be fasting. There would be atonement for Israel's sins. It was a recognition of their inability to make any atonement for their own sins. Do you understand that that doesn't change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant? That the core of faith in God starts with an admission that we are unable to atone for our own sins, right? And this was an exercise in that. A recognition that they could not make any atonement for their own sins. And so the high priest took a bath, put on the fancy clothes, made atonement for himself by sacrificing a bull and for the other priest, and then a goat for the sin offering to be sacrificed, sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat. And then the key element was when the scapegoat was sent off into the wilderness after Aaron confessed all the sins of Israel over this live goat, which then symbolically took away all their sins sins it's where we get the term scapegoat Have you ever heard that when you're in a meeting or in a setting you go hey he's just you know, he, he's a scapegoat now right it's where we get that term the scapegoat was this goat who took on the sins of others so when we say someone today when we use that term modernly we're saying that person is going to pay for something that's not necessarily their fault right and that goat took on the sins of israel symbolically and then it took away their sins the goat had an escort who had to wash you, you you read that we read that the goat had an escort who had to wash before he could come back into camp it the process represented the transfer of guilt from the people of israel a complete removal of guilt from their midst the goat took the sin took the blame from them and carried off their sins of course that is obviously some powerful symbolism for what we know that the Lamb of God would eventually do for us like we've been studying in John. Here's the fourth thing. God reminds them about their sacred gatherings. Okay, now we're not going to read these passages, but 
chapter 23 and chapter 25 in great detail talk about the different feasts, the Sabbath, the year of Jubilee, right? The years that they were not to, to plant their crops and let the fields rest and all those kind of things. And there was a reason for those things. Why? To serve as a reminder of who God is and what he has done. And I thought about us today. As Christians in 2017, we're a long way from here, aren't we? This is a long time ago, right? And these people lived in an old covenant, and we are believers in the new covenant. There's lots of differences between then and now, but there's also a lot of similarities. And so what are some of the things that we do today? Well, we have two ordinances in our church, right? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Why do we do those things? Same reason that once a year they recognize the Day of Atonement. That when that goat took off and symbolically took away their sin, when it was their sin that he was taking away and not necessarily the goat's sin, that was symbolic to them to teach them the importance of the substitutionary atonement that would come someday. When we do baptism, we're declaring that the old Gary is gone, the new Gary is alive in Christ, right? When we take the Lord's Supper, we're continuing to declare to people that we believe deeply in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, right? And we declare it that way, the scripture says, until he comes. We'll continue to declare it. And I think about what we do at Easter and what we do at Christmas. I was thinking about my family Christmas traditions. We have some, um, I'm so grateful for my wife. I'm not a very good tradition kind of person and my wife, early on when we got married and started having kids, Heather said, I want us to have some things that we do that our kids remember every year. And if, I, if I'm honest, at first I was kind of like, oh gosh, I've got to remember to do all these things, right? But our kids do know some things that are going to happen at Christmas. Now, you know your family traditions well enough to know that there are times which our kids may roll their eyes at us because they're having to do a certain thing. But in every one of those situations, when they get older that serves as a reminder to them of the things that are most important in life. And then I think that my kids will probably someday carry on traditions with their kids who will probably roll their eyes at them to teach them about the one true God, to teach them about the things that we believe so dearly and that we have dedicated our lives for. And then Hebrews, of course, when I think about their sacred gatherings, the book of Hebrews says very clearly to not give up meeting together, right? A summer in the habit of doing, but spur each other on with love and good deeds. In short, the priest of the Old Testament made their sacrifices in substitution of the people being sacrificed. Just the same, Jesus is our sacrifice. Now, I can't uh, finish Leviticus without reading these passages again in Hebrews, so I'm going to read you a couple of passages in Hebrews and a couple of verses in Romans, okay? Hebrews chapter 9, if you want to turn with me, that's more than fine. I think we're going to have it on the screen. But Hebrews chapter 9, we'll read verses 11 through 14. And then we'll read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. And these are just powerful words. We read the Old Covenant in light of the New Covenant. Okay, so here's Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. And then I move over a chapter to Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's us, church. That's us. By that one act on the cross, Jesus presented us as spotless and blameless. I love, I challenge folks during their marriage ceremony. I did a marriage ceremony last weekend that I told you about the trip home from. And in those marriage ceremonies, every time I challenge the husband to present the 
wife is blameless and pure by the washing of water through the word because that's what the scripture challenges us to do about that mystery that is Christ in the church and that is a bride and a groom. It's what Christ does for us. That's my challenge with my wife is to present her as blameless through the washing of water through the word. That's what Jesus did for us through that one sacrifice, through that one offering. That's our hope. And then finally, I'll give you Romans 8, 3 and Romans 10, 4. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Okay, pretty clear. And then Romans 10, 4. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I think if you, I think if you started to study Leviticus and these books in the law with the principles that I gave you, and then you got an outline in there, and then you got some more principles in there, and now you got an overview. And then I think if every time you looked in the law, you were to read Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, Romans 8, 3, and Romans 10, 4, I think it would put us in the right context to understand the Old Covenant and how it leads us to the New Covenant. Okay? Let's spend a little time in prayer tonight, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. We, I stand in this pulpit week after week just wanting to declare what you've said, just wanting to repeat what you've said, just wanting to parrot what you've said so that we can follow you with all of our hearts and all of our lives. Thank you for the family that joined our church this morning, for the young men that will baptize, and thank you for the others who I know are baptizing soon, uh, even adults that have placed their faith in you, just for the wonderful work you continue to do here. Um, we want to be on mission with you. We thank you for the wonderful adventure you give us to be on mission with you. Help us to continue to pursue families, to pursue individuals, to call them into the light like you called us into the light. Help us to do it with love. And we thank you for how these Old Testament books and literature lead us and point us toward you. We ask you to be with us as we go this week. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. You guys are dismissed.